Hello, my name is Michael Lambert and I'm an entrepreneur. Last week, or about 10 days ago, I posted a video about Brexit. And in that video I explained that Brexit would have a, a, a disaster effect upon uh, small businesses and medium-sized businesses who are going to find it very difficult to export to the EU in future. I explained that whilst Brexit imposes a great deal of extra paperwork, bureaucracy, uh, expense and inconvenience upon exporters from the UK. The real problem was that it imposes the same inconveniences and expenses upon EU importers and that they're simply not going to accept it. And likewise, and, and consequently, they will seek alternative suppliers elsewhere. And of course, we're seeing in the newspapers all the time, we're seeing uh, so much evidence that that is actually what's happening. They're just buying from somewhere else, from within the EU. Now, when I made this uh, video, I thought, well, if I get 250 views, that'll be, that'll be a result. I'll be very happy. And I thought I'd get a few comments, mostly from people saying, uh, you lost, uh, suck it up, or, or stop whining. Um, and so I was astonished to find that I've got, in the last 10 days, 28,000 views, um, 1,000 subscribers, uh, two and a half thousand uh, likes and uh, about 1200 comments and I would like to say um, that I'm extremely grateful to everybody who commented because a lot of people went to a great deal of trouble to comment and a lot of effort and so on and uh, some very very helpful and interesting comments but I haven't had time to respond because there were so many which is nice position to be in but I'm, I'm I am sorry uh, it's not out of discourtesy it's because I just haven't had time to to, to, to respond to everybody um, <clears throat> the comments were quite interesting and as much as there were of the of all the comments I would say well over 95 percent were positive and sympathetic there were the few um, you know you lost get over it type which were generally not very um, not very intelligent um, but almost everyone was sympathetic and there were a lot of comments from businesses throughout Europe and every single one of them said we have stopped dealing with the UK and we're not going to deal with the UK again. The vast majority of, of comments were along the lines of your country's gone mad or our country's gone mad. Um, just, just, just total inability to understand such stupidity as, 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 as Brexit, such self-inflicted self harm as, as, as Brexit is causing. And uh, anyway, as a result of the fact that it was uh, um, so well received, I decided to make a, a, a further video. And to today I want to talk a little bit about um, the importance of business, particularly in the light of our Prime Minister's uh, F-U-C-K business comment, which must rank as one of the stupidest, um, most ignorant and crass comments any any leader has ever made. I mean, it's just utterly, utterly ridiculous. <clears throat> so, we all want better hospitals, better schools, nice roads, police force that comes when you get burgled right away instead of three weeks later. We want, uh, particularly we want a, a, a good social care for, 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 for an ageing population. I mean, we've We've managed to uh, make this a very hostile place for uh, people from Eastern Europe to come and so they're, they're, they're all going home. And so we're going to need a lot of care workers and so on. So we want all these things and we want them all to be provided to very high standard, as, as high standard as possible. And whenever you hear anyone who say, for example, is a, a head teacher or a, a hospital manager on, on, on television being interviewed, there's a constant, constant theme, and it is always, we need more money. The government must spend more money. We're underfunded. The cuts went too far. Spend here, spend there, spend everywhere. And at the same time, you've got people saying, business taxes are killing the economy. We've got to cut business taxes. Well, there is a problem here, isn't there? The government doesn't have any money. Government's money comes from us. Now, the government can get money in 
at the moment in one of three ways. It can borrow, it can print, or it can tax. The first two are unsustainable, but the third is. Now, let's just look at borrowing for a moment. <clears throat> We're borrowing two trillion pounds at the moment, the highest it's been by a very, very, very long way. And I think you can say, you can say a lot of that is to do with COVID. And I don't think anybody can criticise a government that borrows money in a national emergency. I mean, they have to. You know, when you're fighting a world war or you're fighting a pandemic, you've got to, got to, got to get money wherever you can. And if you have to borrow money, borrow money. Um, and there are a lot of people saying now that we should just go on borrowing because interest rates are so low. Well, I remember not that long ago when every week you get a letter from the credit card company saying, borrow £10,000 or switch your, your, your balances here. No interest for three years. Well, of course, the three years runs out. And whilst the borrowing we've got is not on any time limit, we don't know that interest rates aren't going to go up. And if they do go up, it's going to be a huge hit on the economy because of the, the, the scale of the borrowing. So borrowing's not something you should go on with <clears throat> if you can possibly avoid it. And another thing about borrowing money, especially when it's at almost zero interest rates, is that you kind of feel a little bit freer with it. You kind of splash it around a bit. And I think that might have something to do with the way so much money has been wasted on PPE contracts. You know, the guy in Spain getting a 70 million commission to introduce a guy in a jewellery maker in Florida to supply PPE. Uh, and all these other you know, endless cases of firms that have nothing to do with supplying PPE. That's all a great waste. If the money had been more difficult to come by, I think probably though some of those decisions might not have been made. And you have to question how you can borrow 22 million pounds, 22 billion, and spend it on track and trace run by the wife of an MP. Track and trace, which doesn't seem to be having a great effect on figures and who knows where the money's gone, what it's done. And the other thing about spending money a bit freely is something I just don't understand. We elect 650 MPs and we employ hundreds of thousands of civil servants. And yet whenever a big project comes up where there's an awful lot of money being spent, we call, we call consultants. We're on the phone to, to Serco or Deloitte, whoever it is. And these people come along and they're charged out at a thousand pounds a day. You know, dozens of them, hundreds of them. We're spending hundreds of millions in consultants. Well, what is it all these consultants know that people who work in various civil service departments don't know? Why do we need these consultants? And are they experts on anything? Because consultants who are consulting about healthcare matters one week might be consulting about railways next week. Who knows? And of course, there's the other point that consultants can come along and give lousy advice, give wrong advice, and they're off. No consequences. So I think in terms of borrowing and spending money, you have to be really, really, really careful. Now, the government can print money. It has printed a fair amount of money since the financial crash. And uh, we all know that printing money doesn't involve any ink. It doesn't involve any paper in printing presses. What happens is the government says to the banks, you can create some money and lend it. And so the banks tap on a keyboard and a few numbers on a screen and suddenly there's 500 million pounds to be lent. And the banks lend the money. And of course, it is their responsibility to, 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 to lend uh, prudently. And so they look for people with assets. And so when you print money, that money ends up going into assets, being lent to people who have, who have or who are buying assets. And of course, the most common asset of all is housing. And so we find ourselves in this rather interesting situation right now, which I'm sure historians of the future will be poring over, where we know that in the next year, maybe not at the end of April, but later, furlough is going to end, and maybe up to a million people are going to lose their jobs. A lot of them, people who won't be able to pay their mortgages, won't be able to pay their rent anymore. We know that thousands and thousands of businesses are going to go bust. We know that we're going to lose an enormous amount of trade from the EU. In other words, we're facing a big financial crisis. And yet, right now, people are scrambling to buy houses. 
where I live. A house comes on the market one day and two days later it's sold. I know that the, uh, uh, the um, um, stamp duty holiday has exacerbated all this, 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 um, this rush. But it does seem to me it's quite extraordinary why uh, house prices are so high at a time of, of such uncertain financial future. So printing money is not really an option ongoing. So you're left then with taxation. Now, if you divide the economy, the economy between uh, public service, uh, by, uh, the public sector and the private sector, the public sector doesn't doesn't make any money at all. Doesn't generate any wealth whatsoever. All the wealth, all the business activity that is taxed, is generated by the private sector. The private sector is businesses. And uh, if you work in the private sector, every time you get your salary every month, a third of it goes straight to the government. Every time you buy anything, you pay for a service anywhere, unless it's something that's VAT exempt, such as food and children's clothing and newspapers and things. <clears throat> Almost everything you ever buy, 20% goes straight to the government. And then if you buy wine or you buy beer or you put some petrol in your car, a huge chunk of that goes to the government. But this is all, all money that is generated by the private sector. It's all provided by businesses. And all businesses have premises, and on those premises they're paying huge, huge business rates. Indeed, there's a whole uh, cabal of uh, right-wing Tories at the moment, right to the Prime Minister, asking him to, to do, or right to the Chancellor, asking him to uh, reduce business rates, which would just make the tax shortfall even, even more, more difficult. And so, given that... Oh, incidentally, sorry, just one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, the, other, the other source of, 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 of taxation is corporation tax. And I'm going to make another video separately about corporation tax because taxation for small businesses is now becoming so easy to evade. Um, London, as you probably know, is now known all over the world as the money laundering capital of the world and tax evasion capital of the world. It's just so, so, so easy for small businesses. As I say, I'll make another video and I'll probably include explanations of how they do it and so on, how easy it is. That is another area which really seriously needs tightening up. Um, but anyway, going on. Um, so the government can do one of three things. It can make further cuts, which quite frankly, there isn't much to cut, is there? I mean, everything's been cut over the last 10 years and there isn't a lot of, a lot of lean in the... Uh, in the economy to cut. Um, a lot of fat, sorry. Um, the government can increase taxes. Now, to increase taxes at a time when the economy is in such trouble, doing so badly, would seem to be madness. You know, it's like uh, a guy getting out of bed for the first time and he's been convalescing, uh, sorry, he's been, uh, he's been in bed for a while and you say to him, well, can you carry this haversack with 50 pounds of rocks in it. I mean, it's not, not a good idea to burden, burden the economy right now with uh, further taxation. And so you're left really with only one possibility, and that is to generate more business. It's not easy, it's not something that can be done short term, but it is the only solution. There is no other, there is no other solution. So to generate more business, well, for existing businesses, you have to support any business that has a future. You know, a lot of businesses for the last last year or so have spent all their reserves and they're really going to find it very difficult to get started again. You have to support them. If they have any future, you have to support them. But above all, and this is really my message today, above all, above all, you have to work to help people to start businesses. You have to teach business studies in schools. You have to teach it in universities. You have to provide ways by where, whereby people can get help, where they can get advice, where they can get money. And to start a business, it very often doesn't cost very much. It's maybe 5,000, 10,000 pounds. For a million pounds at 500, 5,000 pounds each, you can start 200 companies. 
Now, the majority of those will fail, but just some of them may succeed. And if they do succeed, who knows how much, how successful they might be. They might employ, in, in a few years' time, might employ 50, 100, 1,000 people, who knows? But unless we do this, unless we cre create more business, which enables the government to raise more taxes, we have no other way of solving all our problems or prospering. And not forgetting again that Brexit is already dragging us, really dragging us back. And I'll leave you with just one thought, which I think is worth dwelling on. And it is this. If you think about all the really, or some of the really great companies in the world, you think about Apple, you think about Microsoft, you think about Amazon, or think about Samsung, all these mighty, mighty companies. These companies employ hundreds of thousands of people. They have billions in turnover and they're paying billions in taxes. They may well juggle about with where they're located to avoid some corporation tax, but they're all employing thousands, all these hundreds of thousands of people. They're all paying tax. They're all producing goods or supplying services that are taxed. They all operate from premises that are taxed. These companies are contributing hugely to the economies where they're operating. But there's one thing they all have in common. Every one of those mighty giant companies was started by one man. Just one guy with an idea who wanted to start a business and managed to do so. And had a bit of luck, a bit of backing and produced these huge, huge enterprises from a single idea. And it's that is what we should be looking for. I'm not saying we should find we think we're going to find more Apples or, or, or Teslas or uh, Samsung, just like that. But, you know, there's a, 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 a lot of sizes of business between that sort of business and being a, a, just making enough to make a living for yourself. You know, it's a question of, 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 of uh, how far you can go with the business. And uh, if you lose 95% of the business that you start, that 5% that remains almost certainly going to more than pay all the ones that you lost, the uh, small investments you made and the ones that never got anywhere. So anyway, that's my, my, my take. And, and, and um, I, I, I apologise if it was all a bit too um, obvious. I mean, it is pretty, pretty obvious. But you have to wonder when the Prime Minister says, if you see K business, um, whether or not it's obvious to a lot of politicians. So if anybody does want to comment, I'd be very, very pleased, uh, again, I'm very flattered if you do do comment. And once again, I apologise in advance that I may not be able to answer many, uh, many comments. But thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.